Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have uh, Dr. Jonathan Hawes. He's a professor and a chair at University of Louisville. And uh, he does some archaeology work out in the field. We're going to talk about his research and uh, his field work. So, Jonathan, thanks for coming. Oh, well, thanks for having me. Yeah, so tell me about your field work. I know that the part of it centers around a really interesting cave that you've done some really interesting exploration of. So let me know. Tell me about it. Well, I've been uh, investigating early modern human ancestors, uh, mainly in Europe for the last 25 years or so. Um, and in the last 10, maybe years or so, uh, the cave that I've been excavating, actually, we've hit layers that would be from the Neanderthals. And um, so the research trajectory has changed a little bit. And now I'm focused a lot on the process by which modern humans dispersed when they came out of Africa up through the, the Near East and into Southeastern Europe, across Western Europe, into what is now Spain and Portugal. And what happened to the Neanderthals who were living in all those places, right? Well, except for Africa. So We've been investigating this cave because it's got very long sequence in time, and it's a fairly continuous one that goes from about 10,000 years ago back to maybe 70 or 80,000 years ago. Uh, and the time period that we're most interested in here is the time frame that's roughly between about 45 and 35,000 years ago. This is the time period in which Neanderthals go extinct and early modern humans, people like us, migrated into the region. And what we don't know is, was there direct interaction and, and what was the nature of that process? There's a lot of new genetic evidence right now that demonstrates very conclusively that modern humans interbred with Neanderthals in many places and over several thousand years. And most of the evidence suggests that that happened somewhere probably on the edge of uh, Southeastern Europe and into the Near East. And so by the time people modern people arrived in the far western part of Europe, the, the interaction seems to be a little bit different. And it's still unclear exactly what that interaction was like. I mean, there's possibly some exchange uh, in terms of interbreeding, but no direct evidence yet in the genomes uh, that that took place. We also don't have, at least in Spain and Portugal, at least in southern part of Spain, uh, evidence for a lot of sharing of technology, right? And so that's been one of the main uh, reasons why people thought uh, that Neanderthals survived much later in Spain and Portugal than anywhere else, and that they were successful enough that they were able to sort of keep anatomically modern Homo sapiens out for some period, but then they didn't interact with one another. That's kind of a weird well, idea. Did, did they interact? Did they interbreed or did they not like have any insights now into what happened to Neanderthals? Because I guess... There's a certain percentage yeah. of people that have significant Neanderthal D DNA in them. Right. So everybody pretty much has somewhere in, you know, the one to two percent range. And and even into Africa, there's there was sort of an integration of Neanderthal genes back into Africa. And so there's a small part of the African population's genome that has some Neanderthal contributions. But when you get up into um, Eurasia, it does increase uh, quite a bit. It's still fairly small. But it's significant. And, um, and so there's definitely this interaction that may have happened over, you know, a couple hundred thousand years or so, right? I mean, the earliest uh, evidence that we have of, of modern humans going up into Europe now seems to be in Greece, you know, maybe a couple hundred thousand years ago now. And there's a, a new study of the Neanderthal Y chromosome that suggests that it was replaced by a modern human Y chromosomes at that time. And so then the mitochondrial side was effectively replaced uh, and uh, absorbed into the modern populations uh, much later in time. So by, you know, 45, 50,000 years ago, there might be some, you know, late uh, interaction, interbreeding. What do you think happened with Neanderthals and uh, Homo sapiens? Do you think that they bred, they fought and one got wiped out or they just kind of 
merge together genetically? Like, what do you think happened? It, it may end up being sort of an all of the above, right? So I mean, we know that, you know, when human populations come together, that they, you know, they trade and they exchange, they interbreed and they fight, right? I mean, it's just the nature of humans. And so they probably did all of those things. But one thing that seems to be increasingly apparent is that human populations, Neanderthals especially, were very low density on the landscape and they were susceptible to localized die-offs. And that's all related to uh, extreme fluctuations in climate and changes in environmental productivity as, as a result. And so there were these, you know, boom and bust cycles probably. And it, it may just be that, you know, modern humans came out, they had a little bit of a demographic advantage, perhaps maybe a lower, you know, infant mortality rate, but they were able to sort of outdo uh, from a population standpoint, the Neanderthals and sort of just maybe swamp them out, take them in and effectively sort of blend their populations into the modern. And one possibility is in some places that there was no interaction because there was nobody there. Right. So in some places, Neanderthal populations died out and, and moderns came into a region that had been abandoned. Um, and so they're they're just, you know, the new population that repopulates an area. Well, are they considered usually a definition of a species is that there's reproductive isolation, you know, across right. species. But are Neanderthals and Homo sapiens considered the same species or different or what was different about them? Yeah. And that's a big debate right now, too. I think there are a lot of people that still hold on to the idea they're different species and these are species level distinctions. But with the new genetic research, it just seems that we're looking at differences that are, you know, sort of uh, below the species level, if you want, if you want to call it subspecies or, uh, or something like that, or just, you know, population, there are clear differences, but, you know, one of the things, yeah, right, is uh, reproductive isolation and the inability to produce viable offspring, uh, between two populations, then you would consider them different species, right? And then in this case, though, we know that they're interbreeding successfully. Okay, so right there's one sort of violation of the idea of, a, of what a species is. We look at morphological differences in the skeleton, right? And it's mainly in the skull. Um, and we still don't really have a good understanding of how plastic, you know, the, the skull is and the, and the, you know, adaptations that led to, you know, differences between ours and, and Neanderthals. So are, are those species level? That's a tough question. And then, and then just thinking about, you know, what is the species, right? I mean, we're, we're a symbiont really of, you know, multitudes of microorganisms, you know, and other things too. So yeah, it's, it's a tough thing to use um, species right now, I think, to distinguish those two populations. Well, have uh, Neanderthal, has Neanderthal DNA been found where it's been sequenced? I would guess it has, right? And Yes. If you yeah, compare that are, to uh, Homo sapiens, what's the diff- what are some right. of the salient differences? Yeah, so I'm not a geneticist, so I can't get to the you know serious details there of of what those differences are. But there are some some important differences, evidence you know that we have taken on you know bits of the Neanderthal genome that we didn't have coming out of Africa that enabled us to um, you know successfully adapt to these new environments. There's and there's some bad ones too, right? I mean they're linking certain diseases, you know, maybe diabetes and things like that uh, with Neanderthal genes that have, that have come into our genome. A lot of that stuff I think is still kind of unclear. Um, th- these may have been genes that were brought in and then, you know, for one purpose and then adapted, you know, for a different purpose altogether. So, but there are enough differences. There's enough variation, you know, between the two that they are different distinct populations that are recognizable by, by the sort of paleogeneticists that have been recovering the uh, ancient DNA from Neanderthal bones. So back to this uh, cave in Portugal, what what have you discovered about it? It seems like you're doing some really innovative work surrounding it. Yeah, so well one of the one of the main problems with this time period, right, is that many of the caves um have these erosional sequences, you know, where sediments wash in and they wash out. So there may be big gaps in time, you know, when the archaeologist goes in, you know, they're excavating through sediments that are 20,000 years old, and suddenly there's a big jump to, you know, 100,000 years, right? And there's a big gap missing there. Um, and that may be due to some kind of uh, localized erosion. There are also a lot of, of weird sort of discontinuities at this sort of transition between Neanderthals and modern humans, where there's, you know, disturbance. And maybe it's because it happened in a short enough period of time so that later people were walking on a surface that might have been you know, just very shallow below them and disturbed 
these sediments and, and there's some evidence for animal burrowing and stuff like that, that plagues a lot of the caves across, across Europe. This is anywhere in the world, really, but especially in Spain and Portugal. So one of the things about this cave is that it's got a, a fairly continuous sequence without interruption. It's really a big sink. It's a, it's a trap for sediment. So there's nothing that's being eroded out and there are no big giant gaps um, in the record. And so, and we've got, we use a, we use a total station to record in three dimensions all the artifacts uh, that we find and most of the bones. Uh, we plot everything that's, you know, basically above or bigger than two centimeters in diameter. Um, so we've got a very detailed mapping of, you know, the spatial layout uh, vertically and horizontally of all the finds. And so, and they're, they, they separate out very well. There's no indication, you know, movement and translocation of artifacts from one layer to another. Um, and we can tell that too by doing some refitting exercises and things like that. So right there, I mean, we're using some some newer technologies to be able to do that. As, as far as the terrestrial LIDAR goes, uh, we've been doing terrestrial LIDAR scanning in the cave as well, um, mainly for a cultural heritage purpose, right? Um, at, at least that's when why I started using it. But it well, also well, has the ability... Yeah. Quick question here. Um, how is a cave used that you've observed over time? Do you know mm. the oldest civilizations go to the way back? Or do yeah. people just use the front part and then certain people will slowly start exploring further and further back? Like, do you have any indication? That's a great uh, question for on a number of levels. So, so, right, the cave is actually probably much smaller now than it was. And part of that is because the entrance has collapsed periodically and, and retreated. Um, back towards the side of the mountain. So the area that we're digging in is what effectively is the back part of the cave. Um, It's, you know, back against the bedrock wall of the cave. And most of the evidence that we found, most of the artifacts have come from that area. We've done some digging in the middle part of the cave, and there hasn't really been a lot of bone preservation there and very few artifacts. The entrance area and the places that would have been still, you know, inside the cave 40,000 years ago, we, we really haven't even touched yet. So, yeah. So when you think about, you know, what, what people do inside caves, okay, well, there's some really interesting studies about the dispersion of smoke from fireplaces, from hearths and how people that lived in or contemporary peoples that live in caves, how they situate themselves in caves and rock shelters to be able to avoid, you know, poisoning themselves really. But what we find is that some of the lower smoking, uh, smoke producing fires, are typically, you know, inside and against the back wall of the cave. Um, And most of the fireplaces that we found are in that very area. But there are other ones that are out towards the entrance of these places. And we just haven't dug down deep enough to hit those yet in the the front part of the cave. So we want to talk about changes in the way people are using the cave over time. Right now, we can talk about how people were using the cave pretty effectively over maybe the last 10,000 years. But when we get back to 40 or 50,000 years, we've got only half the potential area even sampled, right? It's very likely that there are differences in the way people were using the cave. Did that answer your question? So I know outside cities can be built on top of cities again and again, and things amazingly build up like sometimes a hundred feet or more, but in caves, does much change. So over thousands of years, like with, you know, do you have to dig down in the cave to see, what happened 40,000 years versus 10,000 years? Does stuff really get covered over? Yeah, very slowly. What you just uh, mentioned, you know, in earliest, you know, urban centers, earliest cities are often, you know, these big mounds, you know, in, in the Near East and in Southeastern Europe and other places in the world where, yeah, like like Jericho, for instance, you know, where you've got this early settlement, you know, in the Neolithic period, and then it gradually builds up this huge mound of debris from you know, people building mud brick houses that melt into, you know, the ground and they have to be rebuilt and the debris that builds up from just, you know, human uh, and animal waste and whatnot. In the caves, the rate of sedimentation is so slow. I mean, we're talking about 0.2 millimeters per year. Okay. So imagine that it's going to take decades probably for a bone to get buried. And so that's one of the big problems that you also have typically in caves is that the the surfaces that are abandoned by people will then be walked on and utilized by people generations later. That has a tendency of, of disturbing the record. In this case, we've got it's a cave that's fairly isolated in a way. It's up on the side of this mountain, and it, it doesn't seem to have been utilized. Even though the sediment was accumulating regularly, it doesn't seem to be utilized by people regularly enough to mix up you know, the evidence for occupations. 
we're oh. digging down 10 meters, right? Almost 30 feet into, into the sediments to get 50,000 years of prehistory. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. The bottom of the cave is what would get filled with sediment, but the top necessarily probably wouldn't change, or would it? I mean, so if I have a cave and, I don't know, it's 20 feet high, what would happen after 10,000 years? Would it be, you know, uh, 10 feet high? Would the cave just start to sort of slowly fill in? Or like, what happens? To- yeah, kind of, you kind of think about like a bottle, you know, filling up with liquid, right? And, you know, as you get towards the top, it starts to fill up really fast, you know, like there's sort of an increase, you know, because it gets pinched and then and it cuts off, right? And so you've got that gap of air, you know, because that's the way they, they fill these bottles, right? So you got that gap of air between the cap and the liquid. And that's kind of what this cave is like, you know, in a strange way, right? We've got this very deep sequence and then it stopped and there was enough of a opening for people to walk in for the last, oh, probably seven or 8,000 years and the surface didn't change. So in the last seven or 8,000 years, there really hasn't been a whole lot of sediment accumulation inside the cave. It's stopped. And that's probably related to climate and the amount of vegetation that was around on the landscape. You know, imagine the vegetation is probably trapping uh, a lot of the moisture and sediment. And so, you know, when you go back 10,000 years plus, you get into the ice age, even though it's a little bit drier, there's a lot less vegetation. So, you know, you've got sediments that are more susceptible to erosion, and then they can be uh, redeposited in other places, in this case, inside the cave. Does there tend to be anything living inside caves or just the bare amount of lichen or what lives inside caves, anything? So in this one, this one isn't like, um, you know, like how you have some caves that are, you know, really extensive sort of dendritic patterns, you know, with um, lots of passages and, and narrow places where you squeeze in and places that are uh, full of water, you know, so you might have uh, a bunch of different kinds of organisms present there. And this cave is, as I said before, it's, it's really been inactive for a long period of time. So, you know, what's living in there now are about a billion gnats, which they swarm us every day. We walk in there and then they get used to us and they stay on the walls and they don't bother us. It's the strangest thing. It's like we have this communication with them and they get used to us and they're like, oh yeah, the people are back. Okay, we'll just stay over here on the wall. But yeah, it's mostly insects. There's actually some monster toads that we found in there. Birds, little tiny birds fly in and eat the gnats sometimes. We watch that. Mice uh, sometimes come in and make little nests. We actually found a little little baby mouse. It was pink, chirping. You know, it was the strangest thing. And it, it had fallen out of its nest. And so we put it back up on this little pad of moss that its parent had made and left yeah. it. But yeah, that's pretty much you know, what's going on there today. Um, so, but in the past you might've had, besides people living in there, there's, it's pretty clear that there was probably a large owl nesting in there, the Eurasian eagle owl, which is one of the biggest birds, regularly nests in caves and shelters. And there are thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, if not even a couple million bones of amphibians and small birds and things like that, that are the prey of those animals. And um, that have accumulated in there. We also probably have lynx denning in there from time to time. And we've got a handful of bear bones. So there may have been cave bear in there at one point. Interesting. <laughs> well, actually, one of the interesting things about that is we don't know that it's cave bear, right? We just know that it's bear. Okay. So, um, and those are in layers that could potentially have of uh, cave bear. But other than that, there's, there aren't bones of extinct animals in there, which is really strange. You know, most caves from the last ice age are going to be, you know, they're going to have all kinds of different animals in it that aren't there today. You know, hyenas will live in the area. We don't have any hyenas. We don't have any coprolites from hyenas. You know, cave bears were there. We don't have cave bears. We, we have a bear, but it's small. Cave lions, no cave lions, no rhinoceros, no elephant or mammoth, nothing. It's all stuff that you would find on earth today. So what does that tell you that just for a period of time, the the cave is inaccessible or what do you think? Well, it's got to be a couple of things, right? I think part of it is the the location, right? It's up on the side of this mountain. It's in an area where, you know, maybe you're not going to have a lot of carcasses of large animals, you know, that uh, would be the prey of, of lions or, you know, scavenge carcasses that would have been scavenged by hyenas. So we've got the main scavenger probably would have been a vulture. And we do have bones that may have been brought in by vultures. They typically are like the, the foot bones of horses and things like that. 
but yeah, so you don't have, you know, anywhere immediately around the cave places where you would have, you know, lots of horses or, you know, wild cattle or elephants or things like that, that would be the prey of your larger carnivores. So, and, th- and those are the animals that have gone extinct. So what's left are the medium sized, the deer, the ibex, the lynx, and all the, all the different birds. And then us. And then in terms of um, human activity in the cave, what have you found? What thing was was it uh, apparently used for by different people? Yeah. So in the, let's see, in the time frame between like the last, let's say 20 to 10,000 years ago, it was used pretty regularly. And it seems to have been maybe closely almost residential, you know, 10 to 15,000 years ago. But when you go back before that, it seems to have just been, you know, way station kind of, you know, like a hunting camp place where people stopped and, and, and spent the night very briefly and, you know, maybe resharpen their tools, you know, maybe process some, you know, animals that they've hunted, repaired their gear, you know, whatever, but this doesn't seem to be a very intensive um, occupation, but going back to what we were discussing earlier, when we get that deep and that old, we're, we're just in one particular area of the cave. So it may just be that we've just missed you know, the major concentration of where they were doing a lot of their domestic kinds of activities. There are other caves in the area um, that show when you get past 20,000 years ago, going back to, you know, 40, 50,000 years ago, uh, there are usually a lot more carnivore remains inside these caves, which suggests that there's still a lot of carnivores on the landscape and that people are sort of sharing, you know, alternating anyway, their occupations of these places with, with different animals. And after about 20,000 years ago, all that kind of disappears and it's pretty much human occupation, you know, and it's just a question of how, what, what part of sort of their network of settlements is this, you know, is it a, is it a residential camp, a bunch of people, or is it just a, like a couple of hunters spent the night there? How do you know where to dig in the cave? I mean, if you look at the bottom sediment, how do you know there's an area that, um, you know, has been undisturbed for a very long time versus an area that, uh, you know, how do you know where to dig? I guess essentially is what I'm asking you. Yeah. So first of all, I'll just go back. We don't know where the bottom is. Okay. We haven't reached the bottom. We haven't reached bedrock. We, we did some ground penetrating radar a few years ago, and we think that maybe there's another three meters to go before we would hit the bottom, but that's not confirmed. So yeah, where do you start? And in this case, and in a lot of cases, these are places that have been known. This cave was excavated partially back in uh, 1959 and 60. The people that excavated it, you know, we don't know exactly what they did because it was never published. Uh, we do know that they encountered probably iron and bronze age, human burials, ceramic vessels and things like that, and some other associated grave goods. And when we went in there uh, in 1994, there was a profile, you know, in the back portion of the cave. And, and that's a lot of things. What, what archeologists look for is, okay, is there an exposure where you can see, you know, some of the stratigraphy and then you start there by cleaning that off uh, and then maybe going a little bit deeper. And that's what we did. And we immediately hit a fireplace and we got a radiocarbon date of about 12,000 years ago. So we knew, okay, this is the right, right time frame. but at that point, you know, what do we do? We, we began an excavation there because that's where we were finding material and it was exposed, right? So to go to a different part of the cave, we had to, to start at the top, right? And to dig kind of blindly, right? You know, we don't know what we're going to encounter yet because we haven't seen any of these sediments in profile in another part of the cave. So basically been sort of gradually expanding the area of the excavation to be able to reach the deeper and older deposits so that we get a nice, you know, profile of what, what's happening. And it, it seems that by doing that, we've been able to reach now in the back part of the cave, places where people were, were doing a lot of things. And that's enriched the sort of the archeological record, um, if you will. But we went through several years where we weren't finding a whole lot. You know, you just got to, you know, archaeology is a lot, it requires a lot of patience I and mean, maybe more than fishing. I don't know. It uh, also requires, you know, perseverance. As you're discovering how people use the cave at different time periods, what is there an overall picture that's coming to you? Again, did they migrate forwards or backwards in the cave? It's just whoever used it at that time just used it for their own ends. I mean, do you, do you think that the cave was used frequently enough where the new groups that came in saw evidence of the old groups and changed what they did, or it just looked kind of fresh to 
whoever was there or just undisturbed or. No, you hit on something really important there, I think, and that there's good evidence, not necessarily from this cave, but from other places all over Europe, especially, but in other places too, that people visit, you know, these places on the landscape they know about, right? They've either been to them or they're still part of their oral traditions and stories and they'll, they'll find stuff that were left, that was left on the, on the ground surface and maybe pick it up if it's still usable, resharpen, reuse. A lot of evidence for people doing that uh, over, over thousands of years. So, so that's something that even though they weren't using it continuously, it was probably something that was already, it was always known. And yeah, so where, where do they typically conduct various activities? Okay. Well, I mentioned there was a lot of almost maybe residential type activity, you know, in the back of the cave between 10 and 15,000 years ago. I mean, it seems like just given the amount of charcoal and ash and animal bone in there, this was basically a big meat processing smokehouse, if you will, you know, for, for processing meat uh, at that point. Now, that doesn't seem to be the case when you go back further into time, though, because we don't have those thick, ashy deposits back then. So, yeah. So, and also you can see the retreat of the cave entrance, right? Which is really, it's really interesting. Now, on the outside part, there are these huge blocks, right? And they, they match up places on the bedrock top where you can see where they've tumbled over and fallen because of either earthquakes or just, you know, time and erosion, right? Uh, and we know that the, that the cave entrance has retreated several meters. Um, so you can see just the, the shape of the cave has changed. So what, what people encounter would have been slightly different, you know, every few thousand years or so. So what other insights are you postulating that you're going to find in the cave or who knows? You're just going to keep exploring, exploring. I mean, what's next? Yeah. So, well, you know, two years ago, we hit a layer that we didn't think had artifacts in it that suddenly did. And those artifacts turn out to be from a time period known as the Argnassian period, which is the time of the first modern humans in in Europe, at least broadly speaking, let's say there may be some earlier people's using a different technology, but, but that's a hallmark of, of modern humans. And this technology was unknown in the region uh, previously. And so it's turned out to be several thousand years older than any evidence for modern people being there. So we've got to open up more area because we need to find more evidence, right? Uh, Increase the sample size and, and find if there's, we can tell what they were doing in there for one. And then also, you know, were people burying their dead in there? It doesn't, it's not clear that they were. A lot of caves and rock shelters were used, you know, for, for burials. And in a lot of places they're, you know, near the cave wall and we're just getting around the cave wall in some of these time periods. But, you know, maybe it was just more of a residential place than a, than a burial place. So, you know, one, one thing that we would love to be able to find are, are human remains. And, and for this time period, they're just, there aren't any. You know, it's just such a rare thing to get uh, human remains from this time period. Go back to Neanderthal times, there, there are more, but they're stretched out over you know, a couple hundred thousand year period. And there are very few remains of Neanderthals in Portugal. I think there's, you know, a handful of teeth and some like an arm bone, you know, and, and that's about it. So anything we find, I think will be, will contribute, you know, overall to our knowledge. But given all the advancements in, in genetics and the recovery of ancient DNA, ideally we want to find stuff that's going to help us add to the sort of genomic history of Neanderthals and, and early modern humans that are in the area, right? Well, so do you, I'm sure you collaborate with other people that are exploring caves. Yeah. Do they find same things you do or do they find very different things that don't make sense to you? Like what, uh, you know, when you talk to other people, what do they say? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of other caves in the area that are known. Uh, there's There are a couple right now that are under investigation by other teams, you know, we're looking at different pieces, sort of, so to speak, of, of this time puzzle. So like this cave has a great sequence. It goes from about 10,000, at least the archaeology goes back to 50,000 years ago. The sediments go back to about 80,000 years ago. And just over the hill and across another hill, there's another cave where everything, you know, is older than 40,000 years and goes back to 100,000 years. And so there's some overlaps there. It's all Neanderthal stuff in that cave. And then, you know, you go a few tens of kilometers uh, west towards the coast, and there's another valley with some rock shelters there, and nothing is preserved that's older than 30,000 years ago. And so they've got a great record from 30 to 10. So, you know, yeah, we communicate, we read each other's publications, we do, you know, all these different things. 
And you know, everybody has different research questions and they use bits of information that are gathered from other projects and whatnot to be able to put together narrative, if you will, of uh, of the region and maybe c- contribute something overall to to our knowledge of, of human history and the dispersal of our species. It, it's not always collaborative. Sometimes it's a little bit competitive, but um, we do that regularly. I think communicate with each other. To... In addition to this cave, I mean, is this still going to be the main focus of your, your field work? Is there plenty to do or are there other structures, other caves that you want to move on to to do comparisons? I've been, as I said before, I've been digging this cave for about 25 years and, and there may be another 25 there if I wanted. Um, I, don't, I don't know, honestly. Uh, I've got another project. I got two other projects, uh, one in Mozambique and another one in Sudan. And those are with some Portuguese colleagues of mine. Uh, we started working in Mozambique about um, seven or eight years ago. Similar kind of time frame. We're looking at, you know, sort of time frame of the origins and dispersal of modern humans and that's for Mozambique. And, and, and even in the Sudan stuff, you know, the Nile Valley is a corridor for dispersal, dispersal of humans out of Africa. And that was certainly one of the big ones. Back to the cave. The, uh, so the floor is the most changing. Is the ceiling the least changing? And in looking at the ceiling, what can you learn from that? So the sediments that make up you know, what we're digging, uh, it's a combination of, of mud, silts and stuff that have washed in or filtered in. But a large portion of it is rock that has spalled off the walls and the ceiling. Um, and there's so much of it, we just we imagine that as the as the ceiling is collapsing, the floor is rising, right? And there's a kind of a, a chimney, if you will, in the back where you know there's a flaw in the bedrock where a lot of the initial cracking and erosion of the cave itself, the limestone that makes up the cave happened. Um, so that's probably been a source for some of the water and the sediment that's in the cave. Um, so it's probably changed a fair amount, but it was probably, it, it might've been a little bit bigger in the past. It probably was, but we don't know for sure how much. Um, and that just depends on, you know, as we're digging, remember I mentioned the, the bottle, right? The bottleneck, if you will. As we get down lower, it's widening quite a bit, quite a bit more than it, than it was when we first started. So it seems like- I'm sure there's parts of the ceiling that, never collapsed yeah have you looked at the ceiling to see like what's original and maybe if people had fire in there certain stuff collected on the ceiling like you know vaporized compounds or i don't know i wonder what you can learn from it that's a good one too um there's evidence for that in other caves you know where you've got soot and smoke that's preserved and in the calcite that coats the cave walls we're are most of, we have not tried that, but most of what we're looking at is um, sort of the shapes of the cleavage lines in the rock and looking at some of the big blocks that have fallen and sort of just trying to see, okay, well, this block looks like it probably came from this spot on the ceiling, you know, that's mostly what we've done so far, but there's not, we don't have a, a lot of, of calcite on the, on the cave walls. It's pretty much just, you know, naked exposed limestone. So I don't know that there's really a good record of, of the kinds of things you're talking about. Although, I mean, I say that and we, we've never observed anything that looks like a discoloration that could be, you know, some kind of sooty kind of mark or debris. But, but yeah, I mean, those, those kind of compounds could conceivably, conceivably be preserved in the cave and maybe in the sediments. That yeah. might be a better place to look in our case. Okay. Well, very good. Well, oh, oh, last thing I didn't want to, I didn't ask you about is the, uh, so the LIDAR scanning. Yeah. Did that show anything like interesting or juicy? What did you see from that? Right. So we haven't, uh, so we've done some terrestrial LIDAR scanning. We've not done like, you know, infrared or anything. We've never seen any drawings or engravings or anything like that on the cave walls. Sometimes you can pick that up, you know, with infrared or even ultraviolet, but we haven't done that yet. The the LIDAR scan was done mainly as we were digging, you know, it's like, okay, well, you know, we need to preserve a record part of archaeology, right? You're constantly creating the archaeological record, which is a a written and photographic record of what you've done and, and the site itself you know, we have photos and we have videos and things like that. I was like, well, okay, well, let's do um, a LIDAR scan. We'll get a very detailed um, record of the cave as it transforms, as we remove sediment from it. So we can track, give that as a a record of of the site itself. And some from a historic preservation perspective, that's, that's important. 
from a scientific perspective, it allows us to see, you know, the volume of sediment that we've removed each year. Um, it allows us to, with a combination of these orthophoto overlays, we can get really good details of the stratigraphic uh, layers, you know, that are, are exposed in the in the profile. And ultimately, we'd like to be able to to do this with some, you know, features, fireplaces, and things like that. But since we've been using the LIDAR, we haven't encountered um, those features yet, but, but hopefully that would be one one thing that we can do. Is um, it hard to scan in infrared or other spectrums? I don't think so. Uh, it's a matter of money. And we've spent most of our money on the logistics of the excavation. That's, that's what's written into the grant proposals that fund the cave. We started to build in you know, a little bit more each time. What would also be interesting is to do have an airborne LIDAR um, scan of the region. It just seems like there's got to be Potentially, there's going to be more caves around, but none that are obvious that have openings like the one that we're digging in. Who owns this cave? Is it on private land, or is is it you know the country of Portugal own it, or the country of Portugal owns it? Yes, it's uh, it's public land. So a lot of caves. I mean, it seems like they preserve them, but they don't want people even to walk in there. Why is this one? Why are you able to excavate in there? Like, what's what's different about it? So the ones that are protected and closed off. You know, a lot of times they have some delicate ecosystem, you know, that you want to maintain, or like maybe in the case of Lascaux in France, you've got cave paintings, you know, that are going to be susceptible to mold growth and things like that. And we don't really have that in this cave. There's not like a, a bat colony in there, you know, that needs to be protected. There's no cave art. And it was used probably by shepherds. There were skeletons still with skin and hair for, you know, like goats and stuff on the surface when we went in there the first time and somebody built a rock wall around this sort of bowl in front of the entrance. And so it was, it was used until probably the last hundred years, I would guess, probably to, as an animal pen. No one really cared about this thing, you know, <laughs> and, and, and it was never important enough to care. It's getting there. Uh, ultimately, you know, I would like to see uh, a museum or interpretive center uh, built kind of over the entrance so we could protect the cave uh, from any kind of, of vandalism or, you know, anything like that. The, the real threat though, are these wind turbines, you know, these are big deal for getting Portugal off of fossil fuels and, and they've been very successful and they've mounted a lot of these big wind turbines on, on some of the mountain ranges around. And, but this one, they haven't put any, mainly there are TV towers. Maybe they're going to interfere with these things, but that's my real fear is that some kind of development is going to destroy this place. Oh, why would the wind turbines destroy it? Did they have to oh, excavate and yeah, and level off, and you know, so they'd probably be doing some. I don't know if they necessarily would do some blasting, but the, you know, they could potentially be doing things that could cause vibrations that could cause some, you know, maybe the ceiling to collapse in or something. I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I just didn't know just the nature of wind turbines. You know, yeah, no, it's really the insulation, right? It would be the insulation of it. It wouldn't be the actual activity of the blades or anything like that. It would just be the insulation. Well, what does the government of Portugal think about what you're doing? Do they love it? Are they, do they find it's really important or is it like fighting them to, to let you work in the cave? So far, I mean, you know, I've had a permit to dig there uh, in my name for the last, well, since what, 2005. And you know, the cave has been under excavation. It was by a Portuguese colleague of mine before that from 95 to 2001. And, and yeah, I mean, it's considered important. It's, it's hitting a time period that, informs on human history and especially the appearance of our species, if you want to call it species. So, so yeah, I mean, so we've had, you know, pretty good, easy kind of success in, in working with uh, the local heritage office and the, the national heritage office as well. So what's ahead for you the next uh, year or two? What, what are you doing? Uh, well, we had to sort of suspend everything because of COVID-19 this past summer. So uh, my goal is to get back there next summer and to, you know, actually, I really, we were talking about the, you know, areas of the cave that you know people might've been in. There's a lot of sediment in the front and we've got to start taking that down a little bit to get into these older levels to see if there are, if there's evidence for human occupation in those areas as well. It's, it's just killing me to be here and not to be over there digging. When do you think you're going to be able to get back over there? Who knows? Well, hopefully June, July of 21 i guess that okay. depends on the vaccine right well yeah i mean things are moving so okay I, i'm optimistic yeah well all right well, well very good what's the best way for people to find out more about your work where can they go so well our two two web pages linked on my email i, I, I don't know do you want those 
yeah, wherever, you know, people that are interested, where could they follow up and find out more about your work and you and everything? Right. So they could go to the University of Louisville's Department of Anthropology website and look at, at my profile. Um, they can also go to ICAREB.com. It's the Interdisciplinary Center for Archaeology and Evolution of Human Behavior, which is based in Portugal at the University of Algarve. And there's a profile on that on their webpage as well, detailing some of the work we've done and, and with links to some of the open access work that's available to anybody. Well, very good. Well, Jonathan, it's been a great call and thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Oh, well, thanks a lot for having me. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.